Hey, welcome, if you would, our online campus, too. Welcome our online campus. God bless you guys. So glad you're with us. Peace to your house. And uh, how about the worship team this morning? Did they do an awesome job? And I told you a couple weeks ago, and I wanted you to welcome, if you would, Pastor Randy Brummett as our worship pastor. So thank you, Randy. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, wait, 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 wait. Don't sit down yet. Don't sit down yet. I know, right? <laughs> we haven't done this for a long time, but we're going to do this this morning. I want you to turn and greet your neighbor this morning, will you? Make everybody welcome today. Welcome them today. All right, all right, all right. Some of y'all got a little needy during quarantine, you know. No, isn't it beautiful to be back together, amen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're made that way. It's not good for you to be alone. It's not good. And so that's why we got to keep leaning back um, in, into being together. Uh, sociologists and psychologists and pastors and theologians say that we need that interaction with one another. Actually, you need hugs too. Hugs are a very, very vital part of that. And uh, I tell you what, I think everything about the whole coronavirus thing is evil. I'm telling you, it's just evil. And so uh, I'm so thankful to be in the days that, w that we are and uh, so glad that we could all be together in, in church this morning, amen? amen? And we got to greet one another. And uh, another thing I'm gonna be doing today, we did this first service, is we're going back starting today with a stand up, come forward, altar call at the end. And we're believing God for dozens of people to give their hearts to Jesus today, amen? <laughs> Had a great big group of people first service just coming. It's so beautiful, I could hardly talk. You know, just the presence of God and them weeping and making a step in front of everybody that they're giving their lives to Jesus. Just a, whew, a beautiful thing, amen? Well, I wanna thank Pastor Pastor slash Dr. Jordan Vale for, for ministering last week. Thank you, thank you. And uh, just did a fabulous job. Alicia and I were away at a family wedding and uh, that was beautiful. First wedding I've ever done barefooted. We were on a beach at sunset up in the panhandle and it was, I think that's what I'm gonna do now. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. No, it was nice. Well, uh, welcome to group therapy. It's not going to work if you're resistant. <laughs> All right, we are done with dysfunction, y'all. Everybody say it, I'm done. I'm done. It may not all be over yet, but I'm, I'm done. I'm done. Again, I'm done. And uh, we've got two more weeks uh, with this this series, and I want to encourage you, and I, I believe this, I teach in series pretty much all the time, and uh, I believe this fully that a series is a season where God is saying something to our church family. And so in this season, uh, that's what a series is, we can, we're able to expand and learn more and process. My mom taught me to chew your food because the little guy just would wolf it down, you know what I'm saying? And we need to, with the good things of God's Word, we need to kind of take our time and spread out with this. And uh, I've been, I'm not kidding you, this series, just me personally preparing and researching and praying has ministered to me more than any series I can, I can remember. And uh, all of us have some dysfunction. Well, this side admits it. <laughs> all, of, all of us have some dysfunction. Doesn't mean that everything's wrong, it just means that some things are wrong that affect most things. And uh, Jesus wants to set us free and he's made a way to do that. And uh, this goes deep and so um, that's why we've spending a whole lot of time you know, with, with a series. Let me remind you of the, the dual purpose of the church, okay? First of all would be this, it's the saving of the lost. The saving of the lost. And then the healing of the saved. So the saving of the lost has to do mostly with heaven, getting us to heaven. 
And the healing of the saved has to do with here. Because you might get saved, you might get born again, but how many of you know you might still be a mess? Okay? You're forgiven, you belong to the Lord, but we've still got some life to live and, and uh, you know, your significance has changed, but maybe your skill level needs to change on some things. And so it's part of the healing of this because all behavior is need motivated. All behaviors need motivated. I have some kind of pain, need, lack, whatever. That's how we end up, you know, living our lives in the way that we do. Uh, the church will celebrate 32 years uh, as a church in August. And I really have come to know this, that ministry really is about these things. Ministry is about people prepare and it's about people repair. And more and more I see that it is about people uh, repair. But as we said, we're done with this dysfunction. Say done again. And we have to be done not just for ourselves. Now think about this. Not just for ourselves, but for others. Because anything that is left unaddressed, anything that is left unrepaired, we pass it on. So, and remember that what you have is what you pass on. You, what you have is what you will pass on. That's the only thing you can pass on. You could not contact an attorney and make up a, a last will and testament and give to all your children and friends millions of dollars if you don't have millions of dollars. Are y'all with me? And so way on the reverse of this, what you are, how you are, you're going to pass that on. So we need to be done with this function, not just for ourselves, but because with every interaction, every relationship, we're passing on a part of ourselves and we, we, we want it to stop. We're done. We're done with dysfunction. Amen. Sin is the problem. Sin is the problem. And sin is the ultimate root of all dysfunction. So by sin, I mean all sin. My sins, your sins, the sins of everybody, the sins of everybody who's ever been, ever will be. You have what are called sins of commission, those things you commit. You have sins of omission, those things you should have done and did not. The Bible tells us to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So you have sins of commission, sins of omission. And then you have, regarding sin, the condition. And the condition is a people that are lost without Jesus, that we're stuck in our sins with shame, with guilt, with curse, with the ruin, with the poison of all the things that go on with sin. And so sin is the, is the problem, and sin is the ultimate root of all dysfunction in our lives. How many of you would, would agree that Jesus wants us to be free? How many of you would agree Jesus wants you to be free? And see, your whole life, God has a wonderful plan for you. He's giving you gifts and talents and abilities. He's got a great plan for you. And your whole life and even before, you're, before you were born, you have an enemy who's been after you to never let you discover who you're supposed to be really. And to dampen and damage that and to get you off course and to do so many things so that you, you just think, and this is what tragically what a whole lot of people do, they just think, well, it's just my life just the way I am. It's just the way our family is. It's just, we're this way. And Jesus has better. I said, Jesus has better. Amen. Sin also has a ripple effect. So if you sin, how many of you have ever sinned? Okay. It's a facetious question. Whenever you sin, Listen, nothing is done in isolation. There are terms that we use, secret sin, private sin. Nothing's done in isolation. Even though something that, quote, no one knows about, you still pass on the brokenness. You still pass on the, the darkness that goes with that. It affects your interactions. It affects your relationships. And so sin has a ripple effect. Now, I want us to look at Exodus chapter 34. And I want to try to clear up something that needs cleared up regarding sin, in particular, the sins of our fathers, the sins of our mothers. 
I think there's some confusion on this, and let's let the Bible help, help us on this. Speaking of God, it says, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and by no means clearing the guilty. Visiting, watch this, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Getting scary now. Go ahead. Was that it? Oh, okay. Don't go yet. Back that one. Okay, good deal. Get there in a minute. Um, third and fourth generation, it does as well when we're studying scripture to find out context. Who is this written to? When was this written? What is the culture? What is it referencing? You know, there are a lot of things that you pull in to help you understand. Because if you just read that straight up, you say, okay, my great-great-grandpa did this, and so I'm going to be broken too. This is going to be something in my life. And most people live that way. Most people live that way. But third and fourth generation in a Near Eastern ancient culture, which this was written to, that represented the family unit. A lot of households were actually three and four generations living together. Archaeologists show that homes were added onto and added onto and added onto um, because we just accommodate. And so you would have a third and fourth generation. So this is not talking about the guilt, get this now, not the guilt of the sins of the fathers, but the impact, the effect of this. This is not generational punishment being passed on. You don't inherit guilt. You don't inherit a responsibility for the sins and failures of others. But what happens is the effect of sin, the impact of that sin, tears through a family, scars a family, limits a family, sets patterns, sets mindsets for a family. Imagine, if you will, a, a household, a family unit of three and four generations. There's still cultures and nations today where that's, that's part, of their, part of their culture is to live together as a family in that way. And um, imagine that, and let's say that grandpa, great-grandpa, is, decides to become a bank robber. And great-grandma is running whiskey. How many of you know that's going to have some impact on the rest of the family? Okay? Now, I went light on that. I went light on that. Now, bank robbing and running whiskey, that's, that's probably, uh, that's not recommended. Okay? But the, the impact of that, the impact of that, just that they're lying and, and doing something wrong, or if they get caught, or all those things, that's going to have impact on all the rest of the family there. What if it's addictions, alcohol? What if it's anger, adultery? What if it's all the other things that we struggle and deal with and are part of our family stories? You know, are you now responsible? Do you inherit the guilt? Are you, do you have to take the punishment for that? Let's, let's let scripture speak. Look in, it, in uh, Ezekiel. What, you ask? Doesn't the child pay for the parent's sin? Come on, everybody. All right, let's go back and make sure we get this right. What, you ask? Doesn't the child pay for the parent's sin? No. no. For if the child does what is just and, just and right and keeps my decrees, they live for the Lord, then that child will surely live. The person who sins is the one who will die. Okay, they'll bear the punishment. The wages of sin is, is death. So the person who sins is the one who will pay for that. The child will not be punished for the parent's sins. Please read it with me. The child will not be punished for the parent's sins. And the parent will not be punished for the child's sins. Parents of teenagers say, thank God. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Righteous people will be rewarded for their own righteous behavior and wicked people will be punished for their own wickedness. But if wicked people turn away from all their sins and begin to obey my decrees and do what is just and right, start to live pleasing to the Lord, they will surely live and not die. All their past sins will be forgotten and they will live because of the righteous things that they have done. Do you and I pay for our parents' 
our grandparents, our ancestors, do we pay for their sins? No. Are you guilty? Are you that? No. Has it impacted you? Yes. Has it impacted our families? Has it impacted mindsets and patterns in our families? You look and you can see things run through family lines, and if you're not careful, you start to think, well, that's, that's us too. It's just, it just runs in the family. Well, there's some good news about all this. That it's about, uh, and let me go give you one other verse here. Romans 14, 12 says, each one of us will give an account for themselves. So you only give an account for yourself. So look at me. This is just about you and God. No one else. Do you hear me? It's about you and God. No one else. So your life moving forward, which is what we're going to talk about today, moving forward, it's not about the sins of your fathers, your mothers, your forefathers and foremothers. It's, it's not about that. Everything now is about you and God, no one else moving forward. With that in mind, if you hear nothing else today, if you've never heard nothing else in the last 32 years here, make sure that you get this. This is our bottom, our bottom line right here. A growing relationship with God. Look at this. A growing, say that with me, a growing relationship with God. It's, it's you and God. It's not all the family crud and family tree. You know, I... I had an okay life coming up. I don't know, there's something I thought I was happy, and at times I knew I was not. And you look back in our family tree, you look in your family tree too, and there's a lot of fruits and nuts, and we need to do some trimming. <laughs> there's critters up there, y'all. But a growing relationship with, with God, here's what it does. It meets all needs, it heals all hurts, it fills all emptiness. Read it with me. A growing relationship with God meets all needs, heals all hurts, fills all emptiness. If you're glad about that, say amen today. Amen. Well, then the moving on from this, though, is then why are you the way you are? Have you ever thought that about other people? Why are they that way? Do you know what they're thinking about you? Why are they that way? Well, there's a lot of reasons why we, I, and, and you know, we're at church here on Memorial Weekend and Memorial Day weekend, and you know, we love Jesus, and we just had just epic worship service. And, but we're gonna go out of here a little bit, in a little bit, and I don't want you to be all weird and broken. I love Jesus, and I went to church. Yeah, but you're difficult. You're a little strange about some things. That's pretty broken. That's messed up. And so why are we the way that we are? And can we get better? Yes, we can. But why are we the way we are? Here's why. It's what we were born into. It's what we were raised under. It's what we grew up around. It's what was done to us. And it's what we have done. I see some diligent note takers, so I'm going to do this again. Here's why you are the way you are. It's what we were born into. It's what we were raised under. It's what we grew up around. It's what was done to us. And it's what we've done. Do you know what all that is? It's your, your past. Your past. Everybody say, everybody say my past. So your past is your journey. It's your story. It's your history. It's everything prior to now. That's important. It's everything that's prior to now. You have a journey. You have a story. You have a history. And it's not fair for you. This is a good point for me to bring in right now. It's not fair for you to judge other people. How many of you know the United States of America, we are so social media savvy that we have become experts at judging other people, commenting at other people. Look at your pastor. Cut it out. Cut it out. Who are you, Jesus said, that you would judge another? You don't judge. You don't know their story. Well, if that was my story, it would have done way better. Yeah, well, your story made you weird enough, so forget their story. <laughs> okay? But we're not stuck with our story. It will always be your story. 
But how many of you know that God can use your story to do something very glorious? And God will use the most broken things about you, your greatest failures, your greatest pains. God is able to use those and redeem those. And he will use you to comfort others with the same comfort that you yourself receive from God. So you might be here today and say, I've broken, I've failed, I've done this. That's not the end of your story. We haven't read the last chapter of your story yet. And a really good story has some tension. A really good story has some real dramatic and traumatic things that happen. Nobody buys a book and on Monday, Timmy woke up and it was a happy day. He had lunch and everybody loved him. <laughs> On Tuesday, it was even more happy. I mean, that'd even be a sick children's show, wouldn't it? <laughs> Your story's not over. There are chapters. Today, we're about to step into a new chapter of your life. The devil is a liar. He's a liar and he's trying to tell you next chapter's just like this chapter and you're stuck in that chapter. No, you don't, you don't know the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. And he's not done. He's not done. So your past, your story, your journey, your history, everything prior to now, there's something else in the past. You ready? Something else in the past. And that's what Jesus has done for us. What Jesus has done for us. That's the game changer. And what Jesus has done for us, you ready? When you're past, get this, you were born, now here you are. But with Jesus and what he has done for you, now you can be born again. Do you get that? And your past, you have a family of origin. You have a family, depending on what your story is and all the twists and turns that that takes. I'm just thinking about my own family history. I'm thinking about my wife's family history. I'm thinking about so many people that I'm seeing your faces here, the family history and all the twists and turns. And if everything's just gone perfect for you, take a picture of it. Because there's a lot of sharp left turns and we get a wheel off the road and, and off the rails and and so forth. But see, here's the thing. We were born, but Jesus gives us opportunity to be born again. We were born into a family, and because of Jesus, we now have opportunity to be adopted and come into the family of God and have God as our heavenly Father and to have you as brothers and sisters. Amen. Do you all see that? So I've got my past, I've got my past, but what we want to do is step fully into what Jesus came to do for us. Not what was done to me, what, not what was done about my life, not what I did, but what Jesus did for me. And in case you're sitting there thinking, yeah, but this is all spiritual stuff, this is all about Jesus, you're going to see how this impacts everything. Everything is first of all spiritual. And we find the roots and the foundation of all of this from, from this, Amen. Well, I want to talk to you this morning about moving forward. Come on, say it. Moving forward. Y'all, it's time. It's time to move forward. You got your past. You know your past. And it's time to move forward. We are done, as we've said. We're done with dysfunction. Do you remember Joseph in the Bible? Joseph? Coat of many colors, Joseph. Brothers jealous of him and went out and faked his death and sold him, went back and lied to their dad. Then he was lied, lied about and falsely accused and, uh, wow, sold, traded, imprisoned. And it was Joseph that said what the enemy has meant for evil, God has turned for good. Look at me. I want to speak this over your life. What the enemy has meant for evil, God can turn to good. Okay? Now, 
This Joseph had a horrific, traumatic childhood. A lot of it at the hands of his brothers. He had a passive father. He was handled in unjust ways. Yet he ended up running the whole country. But when Joseph, as traumatic and horrific as his upbringing had been, his early years had been, when he became a father, when he became a father, my life now, and when he held his first son named Manasseh, Manasseh means helps me to forget. Look at this in, in Genesis 41, 51. Joseph named his older son Manasseh, for he said, God has made me, God has made me forget, come on, all my troubles and everyone in my father's family. It got to a place where everything in the past God helped him now to forget. This word forget, how many of you know you don't really forget? Sometimes we suppress things, sometimes things slip our mind, but we really don't forget, and we wish we could. But this word in the, in the Old Testament Hebrew for forget, it means to deny, deprive, neglect. And what it's talking about is something that you deny, you deprive, and you neglect it of energy and attention. It's still there. I know it happened. But I'm not going to give it my time. I'm not going to give it my attention. I'm not going to give it my energy. I don't want to make it alive anymore. I don't want to water it. I don't want to feed it. Yes, it happened. Not denying it happened. But I've got somewhere to go. I've got to get out of this function. I've got to get out of my past. And God will help me to forget God will help you to deny it. When you're holding something new in your arms, which is your future, it's the now that's happening to you. Are y'all, are y'all following with me here? Look in Philippians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul writes, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, come on, help me, forgetting what is behind. One more time, forgetting what is behind. Guess what the New Testament Greek word means? Same thing. We're going to neglect and deprive it of energy and, and of attention. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Go ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So moving forward, say moving forward. Moving forward requires, how many of you want to move forward, first of all? Okay, let me give you the options, and then I'll ask you that question again. How many of you just want to stay stuck in dysfunction and let all the crud and brokenness and everything else and wrong mindsets and the devil magnifies those so they're even worse a lot of times in our minds than they actually really are. You'd rather stay in that or you'd rather move forward. How many of you would rather move forward? Okay, and moving forward, what we have to do is we have to forget to start with. And we have to strain, say strain. Strain is energy. And then add to it the word press. So we have forget, strain, and press. When you put all that together, it's I'm leaving something behind and I'm leaning into something and it's effort, say effort. It's effort and it's sustained effort. You can't just all of a sudden one day achieve all that you need to. It's a sustained effort. How many of you know, and my brother and I did this, we watched the Olympics, I don't know what, how old I was. Dave Waddle was running. Do y'all remember Dave Waddle? He's a long distance runner, he had a ball cap and everything. Dave Waddle was running, and he inspired us, and so we decided, because he had a kick at the end of the race, kind of be behind, you know, and all of a sudden at the end, you just go ahead, and that's what we're going to do. So in our trailer park, there's nothing wrong with trailer parks. There was something wrong with our trailer park, okay, just, it's part of my dysfunction. We decided we were going to train and be in the Olympics. You didn't know that about your pastor, did you? We trained for two days. <laughs> That's not press. That's not straining forward. We just thought, 
eh, let's go do something else. And that's the way a lot of people live their lives, okay? But if we're going to move forward, there's going to be a sustained effort. Our healing, our freedom, our growth involves the process of leaving. Leaving. Come on, everybody say leaving. There's a process of leaving. Uh, your whole life is this. Guess what? Leaving matters because you're never going to get somewhere else until you leave where you are. That's the deepest thing you've heard in weeks. It just makes sense. You're never going to get somewhere else until you leave where you are. So if we're going to truly be done with this function, and we've spent weeks understanding it and diagnosing it and everything else, but if we're really going to get somewhere else, we have to leave where we are. And the reality is you've been leaving your whole life. You've been in the process of leaving. Just, just think this out with me. You came out of the womb, and then they cut the umbilical cord. Leaving, leaving, then you were on the breast, and then in the lap, and then on the floor, and then across the room, and then out in the yard, and across the street, and off to school, then maybe off to camp, and off to that job, and away to college or the service, and eventually you leave and you cling to a spouse, and you're progressively leaving and returning leaving and returning, leaving a little further each time, a little further each time until you finally leave. And the plan, we read it in Genesis, we read it in Matthew, Jesus cited it out of Matthew. He said that you leave father and mother and you cleave to your spouse. What that's really saying is this, and if you're here and you're not married, don't, don't hear, oh man, I've blown it. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. It's that you, you've got to leave and go become fully. And here's the goal. You ready? The goal is to be a healthy adult. And by healthy, I'm not talking about your blood pressure and cholesterol. I'm talking about you as a person being healthy and being whole. Now, two weeks ago, we talked about being an adult. And let me remind you of this because it ties right in. When you're an adult, you don't need permission. You don't need permission to think, to feel, to decide, to do. You can do what you want to do. You're an adult. But, everybody say but. But you are also responsible for what you were so free to think and feel and decide and, and to do. So get it. You have permission. You have permission to think, feel, decide, and do. But you are accountable. You are responsible for what you think and feel and decide and do. And so the best advice I can give you, and it's what the whole New Testament is about, is live to please God. Just go live to please God. And so if we'll bear this in mind, tell them I'm busy. <laughs> you have permission, but you're, you're responsible. And this tells you how to be a good neighbor. How to be a good husband, how to be a good wife, to be a good father, to be a good worker. No, I'm an adult. I do what I want to do. Your neighbors are going to beat you up. <laughs> Your spouse will not be, won't stay with you. I do what I want to do. Yeah, but you're responsible for that. And if we live to please God, then we know when to bend. We know when to, you know what? Let's do what you want to do. Or I will be early for work and I will work hard with a good attitude. Rather than, I do what I want to do, I'm an adult. You're going to be an unemployed adult. <laughs> Recently single unemployed. <laughs> so you have permission, but you're responsible, you're accountable. Live in a way to please God. Are you all with me? Let's go back to your family of origin. It may have been wonderful or it may have been horrible or it may have been in between. But you have to leave. That's the whole goal is you leave. You leave family. I can't believe it. Alicia and I have five kids. I've asked her several times, let's have some more kids. <laughs> five kids and now we're almost empty nesters. It's real close. But that's what we raised them for. The umbilical cord is to be cut, not added onto. 
Now, where is that son of mine? Where are you? <laughs> I'm sorry, that was too much for some of you. <laughs> and parents, parents, you've got children growing up or you've got adult children. Look at me. You have to let them go. You have to let them leave. It's hard. Alicia and I are constantly reviewing that to make sure that we do that. We even call them our kids, and it's like, we don't mean that wrong, but you were our kids. But we let you leave. Here's why parents don't let them leave. We want to be the Holy Spirit for them. What if I let them leave and they go and do this, or they don't do that? Or let, trust God. Can I tell you how I pray for my kids? I pray, God, everything they do that pleases you, bless them, give them favor, surround them. And if they do things that don't please you, make them miserable. <laughs> Till they turn back to you. I'm not teasing. I pray that way. I get up early every morning to pray that way. Amen. So whether your family was wonderful, horrible, in between, get this, you still honor your parents. You still love them. You still visit them. We still celebrate together in a few weeks all of our family we rented a lake house and we're gonna everybody my kids their spouses their girlfriends our our grandbabies everybody's gonna come together and it's gonna be healthy and we're gonna celebrate that but they're adults I get it you know they're they're adults uh, but they're not gonna stay with us forever I really don't want them to it's too expensive and sometimes they get on my nerves. I'm teasing, but you know what I'm saying. We raise them to go and to be and to do. We raise them for that. And we've got to let them go, but we still come back. Nothing, nothing blesses me more than my adult children to call me or text me and say, Dad, could I ask you something? What do you think about this? Hey, hey Dad, would you pray for me on this? Hey, I'm going through this situation. Could you help me with this? I mean, that means the world. That means the world. Because if you don't, if you don't leave, get this now. If you don't leave, you're going to be too tethered and dependent. And here's what happens. You'll be still seeking permission. You'll be indecisive. You'll have this need for affirmation that's unhealthy. A need for approval. A fear of disapproval. Anxiety. Inhibitions. You'll be impulsive. And underlying it all, even if you never express it, you'll have anger. You're created, you're designed to be birthed and to continue to leave and return, leave and return, leave and return until you leave and you cleave. And so however wonderful this was, or if it was toxic, it has to have a place that it is in my past and I learn how to relate to it in my present. So moving forward, everybody say moving forward. Moving forward is leaving. Moving forward is also, you ready? Owning. Owning. Come on, say it. Owning. That's adulthood. When you own. And I'm not just talking about owning a something. But you, can you imagine if, you know, the house next door to you got bought by three sixth graders? How many of you know that might not be a good situation? Some of you have neighbors that are up in years and they're worse than sixth graders. And it's because they've taken permission but not responsibility. And they're not living in a way that would please the Lord. You just make sure that you do. Even if everybody else gets it wrong, you get it right. But part of moving forward is leaving and owning. And here's another way to do it. It's personal responsibility. So as I leave and I step into the next chapter, the next season of my life, I own my life now. I take responsibility for my life. And listen carefully to this. Stop blaming everybody else for the way that you are. We're in a new day. I've left that. I've left that. I don't know how to relate to it all properly. But now as I step into owning, as I, as I leave and I step into owning, I take responsibility for my life now. So stop blaming your parents. Stop blaming your childhood. Stop blaming that coach, that teacher, that neighbor. Stop blaming others for how you are. Stop blaming others for your mistakes, your tendencies, your failures, your, dis, your dysfunctional patterns. Stop it. Stop it. You own it now. 
There's some people, and in you know, decades of ministry now, well, it's just the way I am. It's the way my dad was, maybe my great grandfather was. It's just the way I am. And that's why you're such a joy to be around. <laughs> and you weren't designed that way. You weren't created that way. You're created to be you. You're created to end up having the personality of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, meekness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Ended up with 10, there's only nine, but you got a bonus today. (laughs) The personality of the Holy Spirit, not a grumpy grandparent. Own your life, own your, everybody say, I own it. And I love this. You need to have an expiration date. An expiration date on blaming others. How many of you are glad that yogurt and milk have an expiration date on it? I think it's okay. And you peel it back and it's green. Maybe it's supposed to be green. I like that there's numbers on there, okay? Expiration date. Gift certificate, sometimes expiration date. Probation, you have an expiration date. A, a, A trophy or a ribbon that you got in seventh grade. Stop it. <laughs> we don't want to hear about it. You know, when I was in seventh grade, I was, I was so fast. That's why I got that trophy. We don't care. <laughs> Leave your story. I won a beauty pageant in sixth grade. You're not in sixth grade anymore. <laughs> let it go. Just let it go. How many of you are happy for expiration dates? I'm sorry, I went too far. But you need to put an expiration date on blaming anybody else or any other thing for why you are the way you are today. Starting a brand new chapter. This happened in my family, didn't you know? One time this happened to me and somebody said this to me. My dad, my mom, my grandma, my teacher, my coach. uh, Expiration date. I'm leaving that. I own my life now. It's not about anybody else. It's me and God. I'm forgetting that. Oh, you can't forget. Oh, yeah, I can. I can can deprive it of energy and attention. I'm going to step into a brand new day, and God is with me in this day. I'm going to grow in my relationship with God, and that growing relationship with God meets all needs and heals all hurts and fills all emptiness. And what the devil meant for evil... God turns for good. And you step into that. Amen. Let me tell you something. The day you start owning your life is the day you become an adult that God intended. And there are people that are 75 years old, they're not an adult yet. Because they're still blaming, blaming, blaming this, this, that. Nope, no more, no more. I might still be a mess, but I own it now. Whatever happened, okay, that happened. But it's mine now. I'm an adult. I take responsibility, and God will help me now to help me be done with the dysfunction that's in my life. In Proverbs chapter 30, Proverbs chapter 30, it says, there's a generation that blames and has no gratitude. Blames and has no gratitude. That speaks of the arrogance and the ignorance of our culture today. And there's strong biblical warning that you don't be that. That you're blaming and arrogant and and without gratitude. Not the people of God. Not the people of God. Hear me. We're humble, but we're strong. We're grateful. We don't blame others. When you blame others, then you look to a government to fix everything for you. And they can't. They can't. No one can but Jesus. I sound like a preacher, but no one can but Jesus. And you have to give your life to him. But as we step forward and we start to own, let me qualify something. I've got to go deep here just, just for a moment. If your journey, if your history, if your past, if your dysfunction involved physical, sexual, emotional, abuse, neglect, or violence, what you need to own is not personal responsibility. 
You're not responsible for that. What you need to own is your need for help. To get help. Hear me again. When certain lines have been crossed, and chances are, and I told you I had to go deep here just for a moment, chances are with this many people, that's happened to a good number of people here. Physical, sexual, emotional, violence, abuse, neglect. 80% of sexual abuse against children is never reported because it usually happens by someone they know. A family member, caretaker, a neighbor, something happens. And it doesn't get reported. And those things damage the soul so deeply, so deeply, that you need to own this, that I own my need for help. And let me talk about this help. You need to process this and get help from a professional Christian counselor. Hear me. Degreed, trained, certified in counseling and therapy with a redemptive biblical view. Someone who's trained, someone who's skilled, someone who's anointed, someone who loves Jesus. Not pop Hold on, not pop psychology. We have this wandering, wobbling, weird psychology within our culture. I'm not talking about that. It changes all the time. I'm talking about sound psychology and scripture. Old school church says, no psychology for me. Just the King James Version and that's it. And that's why they never smile. But sound psychology, sound psychology lines up with Scripture and helps you to understand your soul. I think it was a trick of the enemy to keep us away from things that would help us to understand our emotions and how we form habits and break habits and and understand our thought processes. And you need to get that together. It's worth the time. It's worth the effort. It's worth the money. Well, I don't know if I can spend that much time. Or I promise you that if your air conditioning breaks mid-June, you're going to find a way to get that thing fixed. Are you all with me? And yet we have this damage, these bombs that have gone off inside of our soul. And it is worth the time, it is worth the effort, it is worth the money to go get somebody who knows how to help you. Not just somebody listening to you. Not just finding some sweet saint to listen to you. You need somebody who can help you sort through complex issues and the damage of your soul and find the healing touch of Jesus deep in your soul. Someone that can help you find a well-lit path with a goal. And I stress this to you. Don't hide. Don't be ashamed. Don't stay in the damage. And if you need a reference, uh, we know some people. Call our care department here at the church and we'll be able to connect you with some folks that can help you in those ways. Thank you for letting me talk about that for a moment. Well, to be done with dysfunction, it's all about moving forward. Not just understanding what happened and that, but moving forward, which involves leaving. It involves owning to let go and to break free from the past and to reach and to move forward, to put an expiration on all the who's and what's and when's and all of that, because it's not what has happened to you until now, it's what you do with that. And it's not what has happened until now, it's what happens from now. It's not about all the previous chapters in your story, it's about the new chapter that I pray begins to be written Today, when in fact, God is the author and finisher, and he's already written these days for you to step into them. It's not what was done to you. It's not even what you have done. It's what Jesus has done for you. And it's what Jesus will do for you. Don't go this on your own. Don't move forward without God. You're going to need God because now as you step into this new day of freedom, it's just you and God. Nobody else. 
You own this. And God will be right there with you to help you. Have that relationship with your heavenly Father, with Jesus, your intercessor at the right hand of the Father with the Holy Spirit who was at creation and was at the resurrection, who lives in you and is with you, help you. To have wisdom that no one else could even have that he will whisper on the inside of your heart. A growing relationship with God, you ready? Meets all needs, heals all hurts, fills all emptiness, so that you and I can be done with dysfunction. Amen. Did y'all get anything at all out of this today? Thank you, Lord.